Hello everyone, uh, my name is Milind Agrawal. I am a Banking and Financial Services Sector Analyst at SBI Mutual Fund and I also manage the SBI Banking and Financial Services Fund. Uh, so today uh, we will be discussing our views on the Banking and Financial Services space, uh, our earnings outlook for the sector over the medium to long term and why we are positive on the sector versus uh, broader index and as far as you know both earnings as well as valuations go, uh, why uh, you know that reflects in our positive view on the sector. Now, you know, if you look at the, the way the sector uh, is, is positioned, almost 80% of the benchmark uh, for the fund as well as in the broader indices within the BFSI space consists of the uh, banks, uh, which is uh, a category within the lending financials. Uh, there is uh, some part of it beyond that, which consists of uh, non-banking financial services that are also in the lending space. But a majority of the sector composition is uh, comprised of the uh, lenders within the uh, BFSI space. Now, uh, if you look at the earnings trajectory over the last year, uh, we've seen a confluence of three factors that has led to fairly strong earnings for the sector. And the three factors that have contributed to this are an improvement in credit growth, an improvement in margins and a very strong asset quality performance. Now, if we sort of break this down further into these three subcomponents sub that have delivered these strong numbers. So starting with the first one, which is credit growth. Now, credit is a direct reflection of the state of the economy. And what we've seen is that uh, from the levels that we were at, let's say a year back, which was, you know, mid to high single digit middling credit growth. We are today at a level where credit growth is almost 17 to 18%. Now, uh, there are two components of that credit growth. Uh, one obviously is the fact that as inflation in an economy rises, there is more money that is needed for the working capital cycle. And so that is leading to some amount of an increase in credit growth. But what is also helping this credit growth is there is increasing demand and increasing appetite from the corporates to borrow and invest in capital intensive industries. And typically we've seen historically that capacity utilization, once it reaches an inflection point, that is when corporates start to think about an increase in the capacity, because that typically also has a certain gestation period before, you know, till the time that, you know, the capacity comes in force and that leads to an output. So if we sort of break down the credit component Further, so there are three broad uh, components. So one is the retail uh, economy, the second one is the SME, and the third one are the large industries. Now, retail credit largely comprises of two or three products. So one is the housing, which is the dominant product within retail. Uh, the second one is uh, the personal loans, and third one is the auto segment. Now, uh, housing, uh, it was reasonably strong even before COVID, but what COVID gave housing was a sort of fillip because people's saving pools accumulated and there was also an intent to sort of move into uh, bigger houses. Uh, so both of these have sort of led to uh, an increase in housing uh, credit growth and the fact that there was supply inventory available as well. So this is all sort of leading to improving credit growth in the housing space. But when we look at the other components of retail uh, credit, which is, you know, the, the personal loans, the credit cards, as well as auto segment, uh, auto segment is coming off a weak base, but we do expect now that auto cycle has seen the worst and improving uh, fundamentals should be seen going forward. As far as the unsecured categories of retail, you know, the personal loans and the credit cards are concerned, uh, you know, the, uh, the lenders had sort of curtailed their risk appetite uh, during the initial days of COVID. But based on the performance that the banking system as well as the NBFC system has seen in the unsecured retail categories, uh, the appetite in terms of risk has returned and hence we expect given the fairly low penetration of the unsecured products in India, that it has a fairly long runway for growth. So on retail credit growth, we are uh, fairly bullish over the medium to long term. And even if we compare, you know, where we stand as a country in our penetration levels for these products versus global peers, we are still in relatively early stages. And just to quote some numbers, so you know, today we would have more than 13 to 14 crore people with a civil score of 750 plus. We would have almost 18 to 90 crore people with a civil score of 700 plus. Versus that, if we see the penetration of credit cards or personal loans, today in India, anywhere from three to three and a half crore people would be having credit cards and you know, personal loans would be maybe even lower than that. So some of the numbers in terms of penetration are still low versus what they can be over the medium to long term. And that is what sort of leads to our positive view on retail credit growth sustaining over the medium to long term. Uh, when we look at the SME segment of the economy, now SMEs, had to deal with certain issues over the last five to six years. Initially, it started off with the demon. Then it was the GST implementation, which had some teething issues because the smaller businesses had to adjust to a new way of doing business. But we believe, uh, you know, they are now in a much better position. 
uh, over the last two years, you know, during the COVID period, uh, there were also a lot of support mechanisms that were provided by the government as well as the RBI, which started off with a six month moratorium. It was supplemented by emergency credit line, wherein the lenders could, or the borrowers could get additional 20% credit. And then it was also complemented by restructuring in case of certain stressed borrowers. So now when we look at the performance of the SME uh, ecosystem within the industry, uh, when, we'll, when we talk to small businesses on the ground, when we do our channel checks, we do get the confidence that demand has returned and there is also an increase in risk appetite for the smaller businesses to go out and do business and take credit from the banking system. So SME component of the ecosystem is also uh, improving from the lows that we had seen for the last couple of years and our outlook is bullish there. It's also driven by the fact that a lot of the SME ecosystem is out of the formal credit net. And as the formalization of the economy happens in part also helped by the digitalization of payments, we believe more and more businesses would come under the financial net and they would be able to avail credit. And hence, this is an opportunity that should play out over the medium to long term. Lastly, when we come back to the large part, which was the industry segment and which had been weak for the last five to seven years because of asset quality issues and balance sheet issues, both at the bank as well as at the corporate level, uh, what we've seen is that there has been a lot of cleanup that has happened. You know, the, the balance sheets at the corporate level are today much stronger than they were in, than they have been at any point in the last seven, eight years. When we look at balance sheets of the banks themselves, banks are sitting on a fairly uh, decent provisioning coverage on the bad assets. And in addition to that, the banks are also carrying fairly sizable capital positions. So there is an increase in risk appetite, both from the borrowers, which is the industries, as well as from the lenders, which is the banking system, to go out and give credit to the uh, to the larger industries. And as we've seen an improvement in capacity utilization, which is a reflection of the demand absorption in the economy, the corporates are also more confident of putting up capacity. So just to put it all together, uh, in terms of the, the credit component of the earnings, uh, we see an improvement in credit growth, uh, which is already at 17-18%. So there is some normalization that we could see over the medium term as uh, as the base effect kicks in because last year the numbers were relatively weaker but still we are hopeful that credit growth should sustain as long as the economy uh, continues to do reasonably well uh, the second thing that has been helping earnings uh, for the sector is uh, the performance on margins now uh, it's it's interesting because you know uh, what we've seen is that uh, in the early stages of any interest rate hiking cycle, which we are in uh, currently, you know, we've, we've passed a lot of uh, uh, hikes there. But typically during the early stages of an interest rate hiking cycle, what happens is that because banks carry a fairly sizable fixed cost deposits in the form of current account and saving accounts, current accounts don't pay anything and savings account rates have not been increased. So that fixed trade book is not seen an increase in funding cost. And what has seen an increase is only the term deposit base. And TDs also have uh, deposits that sit in various maturity buckets. And hence, the rate increase takes time for the banks to reflect in their, in their PL. But on the asset side, what has happened is that uh, more and more loans have been linked to external benchmarks. And uh, those have a quicker reset period, uh, ranging anywhere from T plus one to you know, anywhere in three months. And hence, we've seen that there has been a quicker pass through on the asset side, both by way of loans that were linked to the external benchmark as well as loans that are linked to the MCLR, which is an internal benchmark that the banks have. And so, you know, uh, we've seen an improvement in margin trajectory for banks, and we believe that it has still not fully played out. There is still uh, some more margin expansion to play out over the next couple of quarters. But if we look at our FY24 outlook, we believe that uh, some of the deposit cost increases that we're seeing will catch up a little more uh, and uh, we expect some normalization in margins for FY24 but uh, uh, but we believe the system has the capacity to to absorb some of the the rate hikes that we've seen and hence we don't expect the 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 pace of hikes or the rate hikes themselves to have an effect on asset quality uh, now we come to the third one which is the asset quality performance and which has been the most uh, bullish piece of the entire uh, banking sector if you look, uh, look at the last two to three years. Uh, so within this, you know, uh, retail is one sub-segment which saw some issues uh, during COVID because, uh, you know, a large segment of the population saw their livelihood getting hit. So in the initial stages, we did see some stress points emerge in various unsecured asset classes. But uh, we believe as businesses have come back and people have started earning more, you know the retail uh, the retail chunk of the the uh, the total credit pie continues to do well uh, on the SME front as we were discussing you know there were various support mechanisms that the government provided 
and that is something that has helped the smaller businesses come out of the crisis uh, in a much better shape versus you know when they entered it two years back two and a half years back so SME uh, are uh, you know coming out of a very uh, tough phase over the last five to six years but uh, we believe uh, the asset quality performance based on data that we see has been strong and should continue to be strong over the medium term uh, now the biggest surprise within the entire asset quality uh, space has been from the uh, larger corporates now uh, larger corporates as uh, as i said earlier uh, they've they've come out of a prolonged period of stress uh, today their balance sheets are much stronger not just helped by capital infusion but also because of organic profit accruals over the last couple of years and so when you look at asset quality performance uh, there are very few accounts that we hear have been you know have have slipped into npa category over the last couple of quarters and when we look at the early delinquency data that a lot of banks report that the rbi also reports on a six month basis uh, we do expect that uh, we've seen the worst of the corporate asset quality cycle and incrementally there do not seem to be stress points, at least the ones that are visible in terms of the corporate asset quality performance. So net net putting it all together, our outlook on, on all three is strong. Credit growth is, is strong. It's been better than our expectations. We do expect some normalization there, but it should still be better than what we've seen over the last couple of years. So mid teens is what we expect should be a reasonable number over the medium term. Uh, on margins, we are currently seeing the tailwinds as we discussed uh, because uh, the early stages of a rate hiking cycle. So we still expect some more to more play through, but uh, we expect a normalization from FI24 onwards. And the last one is on asset quality. So asset quality cycles, if you look historically, uh, the cycles uh, when they are benign, they typically last for a little longer and we are in the very early stages. So we do expect on asset quality front, as long as the macro doesn't deteriorate meaningfully, whether that is global macro or domestic macro, as long as the macro holds in place, we expect asset quality performance for the system to be fairly strong. And so, you know, the confluence of all these factors has essentially translated into a fairly strong earnings trajectory uh, for the banking system. Now, uh, when we look at the, uh, the valuations, which is also another important barometer that we should look at because uh, when we look at the entire investment horizon, banking and financial services is one sector. There are other sectors that you know also offer investment opportunities. So when we look at valuations for the space uh, versus themselves, so the banking sector versus itself is trading at valuations, which is now after outperformance year to date, uh, closer to its long term averages. But when we look at the earnings trajectory and uh, you know the the, the valuations uh, in that context, we believe uh, the risk reward is uh, quite in balance. Uh, and that is something that sort of makes our view positive over the medium to long term. So this was on the on the lending financials, which contributes uh, almost 80 percent of the of the benchmark. Uh, there are other components as well within the banking space. Uh, so there is insurance, uh, there's capital markets and there are NBFCs. Uh, now, NBFCs typically uh, on the asset side, uh, NBFCs, you know, uh, investors buy NBFCs for the asset franchise because their borrowings are all wholesale. So typically, when the wholesale borrowing costs, you know, are rising, uh, NBFC is seeing uh, a hit on the margins front, which is what we are beginning to see. And so, while asset performance for NBFC should be strong, uh, margins should uh, should uh, play out in the reverse direction versus what we're seeing for the banks. And so, net net, while we have a positive view on select NBFCs that have a very core and a very niche franchise and a strength that they've built from operating in that segment over 10, 15, 20 years. The earnings outlook for NBFCs as a sub-segment is not as strong as, let's say, it is for the banks. Uh, when we look at insurance, now insurance is an interesting sector because there are two ways to look at it. One is that, you know, the longer term outlook for insurance, when you look at penetration data versus what it is for some of the more developed and emerging economies, insurance penetration in India is still relatively low versus uh, the, the broader global markets. But uh, if we take a slightly more uh, near to medium term view, Historically, whenever there is liquidity tightening in the banking system, which is what we are seeing today, uh, given the fact that almost 50 to 60 percent of the insurance premia for, for insurers comes through the banking channel, uh, through their types with the banks, uh, typically during periods of tightening liquidity, banks uh, prioritize deposit growth over uh, insurance growth uh, relatively. And so we've seen that insurers have seen a slightly more moderate growth uh, in terms of the premiums. Although there has been margin improvement that has played out and so that has kept earnings for the sector fairly strong, but at least on the revenue front, which is, uh, which is indicated by the premium growth, we do expect some sort of moderation till the time that the liquidity situation in the system normalizes. So insurance, again, we are selectively positive, but uh, our view on, on earnings growth and valuation, uh, you know, 
within the various subsectors within the BFSI space makes us more positive on the banking space versus let's say the insurers. Now, when we look at capital markets, capital markets can be played in India through either the, 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 the depository, uh, there are quite a few AMCs that are listed and there are also quite a few broking firms. Now, again, when we look at penetration numbers for most of the capital market products, whether it is broking accounts, whether it is mutual fund accounts, these are still very early stages for us, you know, a couple of crores of, of MF uh, individual PAN accounts, you know, even the broking numbers are sub 10 crores. So we still have a long runway as far as the medium to long term outlook is concerned. But within the capital market space, uh, in the transactional businesses, uh, wherein uh, the nature of the earnings profile is not an annuity like, the transactional businesses typically uh, suffer more in case of a downturn and we've seen a very strong uh, addition in terms of the, the uh, DMAT accounts over the last couple of years. And so when we look at valuations for some of these capital market players versus what our comfort range is, we do expect that uh, we'll, we'll sort of wait for better entry points before we take more constructive view on this space. Although longer term penetration numbers uh, for the capital market uh, industry in general should be very, very strong over the medium to long term. In fact, uh, in terms of penetration numbers, uh, the numbers are even lower than they are on the credit side. So net net, uh, you know, to put it all together, uh, our view on the sector is positive and that is largely predicated on the fact that we've seen an improvement in, in credit growth. And while we expect some normalization, we expect the trajectory to remain strong. Uh, margins are strong and they should be strong for some more time before they normalize but we still expect them to settle at a slightly li higher level versus what they were uh, in the last one or two years and on asset quality again you know it's a big caveat but as long as the global and domestic macro holds up we don't believe uh, that asset quality should take a turn for the worse over the next uh, you know couple of years so to put it all together you know our view on the sector is positive and uh, one of the ways to play that is uh, you know by way of uh, investment in the sbi banking and financial services fund where we invest in uh, stock specific uh, to the sector and that also reflects our view within the various uh, subsectors within the space thank you mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully